Uh, absolute extrema and mean value theorem. Uh, I'm going to give you a whole list of um, things that hopefully you kind of already know. Maybe the wording will be a little different. Maybe it'll be in a way that helps you understand it better. Write down as much as you need. Okay. So, of course, extrema are minimum or maximum y values. This is the thing that's really that trips Algebra 2 kids up all the time. When we talk about minimum or maximum of a function, we are talking about the y values. They occur at points where there is a corresponding x, but the minimum or max represents the actual y or f of x or g of x or h of x of that particular function. So either the smallest possible value or the largest possible value. And of course, you guys have learned that we can look at the whole function, we can look at parts of the function and look at uh, minimum and maximums and, and, and talk about those. So our global or absolute extrema, you need to know both, okay? I don't know which way you learned it. Global extrema, maybe? Absolute. absolute. Say again. Like you're global extrema, then you say global extrema. Yeah, we're getting there. Yep. So global, and so in the world, in the function world, right, they are either greater than or equal to or less than or equal to every other possible y value. Okay? Both terms will get used, and they mean the same thing. The reason that we say or equal to is that sometimes the maximum or minimum can occur more than once throughout a function. Um, the sine function is a good example of that and an easy one to think about, right? One is the maximum that you could ever have, but it occurs multiple times, an infinite number of times for that matter, depending on what our, um, uh, our uh, yeah, I guess domain that we're looking at, sure. Um, or minimum could be negative one. So it can, that's why it's or equal to, because it can happen many, many times, okay? Uh, the other one, of course, that we talk about is, and uh, Isabella just mentioned local, sometimes it's called relative extrema, okay? A relative minimum, relative maximum. Those terms can be uh, used interchangeably. That's when we're looking at a specific area in relationship um, in, instead of looking at the entire thing, we're looking at a very specific window, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, I, I uh, you'll, you'll hear the phrase neighborhood in the nearby area. What's funny? Do you guys not use neighbor? Did you use that one? Is that AP or is that you? No, that's an AP thing. In the na neighborhood? You've never heard neighborhood before? Okay, yeah. Well, there you go. You're welcome. Yeah, in terms of math. In an area nearby in the neighborhood. N yeah, neighborhood is definitely a math term when it comes to talking about extrema, sure. And next, uh, critical numbers, sometimes called critical values. You know, it depends on, uh, it, it's like a dialect. Uh, honestly, it is. Like, uh, the whole neighborhood idea, the absolute or global, I think in different parts of the country they use a different phrase. But uh, I was used to calling it critical values. But in our book, he uses the word, the phrase numbers instead, critical numbers, whatever. It's the same thing, okay? Um, first off, what's important is that the, 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 um, the, the f of x or y has to exist at that place. And also, the derivative at that particular x value is zero or undefined. What is really kind of important is that it can it cannot be a domain restriction, right? And and this gets to the why it, where it exists. If we can find um, a, an x value where the derivative is undefined or zero, but that x value doesn't actually exist because of a domain restriction in our original function, that's not it can't be a critical value. Okay, so that's that's why the f of x exists. And then two more things, okay. Uh, absolute extrema can occur at critical numbers or endpoints. One of the things that sometimes we forget is when we're testing, because this is what we're gonna be doing, right? You're gonna be testing a bunch of values to see which one is the minimum, which one is the maximum. 
Um, and we go through the process and we're, we get rolling and we're like, all right, we got to take the derivatives, seven equals zero, find the undefined, plug them in, bam, 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 test them all out. And sometimes we forget to check the endpoints. Now, obviously, if it's not, if there's not a strict domain given or a window given, um, then there are no endpoints. But just don't forget to check the endpoints. And then um, relative extrema or absolute, or sorry, uh, local extrema can only occur at critical values. Only, they only occur at critical values. That's the distinction. So um, absolute, make sure you're checking the endpoints. Relative, the endpoints aren't really in play. This is, this is all kind of review, right? This is stuff you, re you remember? Okay, good. This is in your book. This is on page 86. I'm trying to do a better job of putting the page number so it's easier to get to. Granted, it's a PDF anyway, so you have to scroll, scroll, scroll. Um, but go ahead and take a screenshot of that from your book, or if you really would rather just take a picture of the television, that's fine. And um, go through and try to do those six problems from the graph, and then we will discuss, and then we'll get into the mean value theorem. Go. All right. Absolute maximum of F. All right. This one's, this one's easy, regardless of endpoints or whatever. Like, you're looking for the highest one, right? So, obviously, that point that I highlighted there is has the highest possible Y value. And so, that maximum value is, in fact, 4. Did you have that right? Yes. Very good. Okay, now, it starts to get a little more tactical. At what X value does F have an absolute maximum? So, now, we're saying, what is the corresponding X to this point, which is? Negative. Okay. Um, what is the absolute maximum point? So we're connecting this all together. Now we're just going to take these, put them together, and make a point out of them. That's why I all made them red, because we're talking about the same red point. Okay? Questions about that? Any of that? Yeah? For one, it would be okay to write, like, F of A equal to 4, if you want just the one. Um, no, that's fine. Okay. That's totally fine. You say Y equals 4. F and negative 4 equals 4. They all mean the same thing. All right. Number four. What is the absolute minimum? What do you got? F of 4 equals negative 2. That's, so negative 2, we think. It, is that what we think? What's the dilemma? What's the dilemma? What? Why? How do you know that? Open circle. We got a little hole here. Okay. Okay. So keep going. Negative one point nine 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 nine, and then someone will add another nine, and someone will add another nine, and we'll all die before we can add all the nines. Yes. So there's all you can never find it. Right. Which means there isn't one. Yes. There is not one. There is no absolute minimum. Okay. And and that open circle, that hole, whatever phrase you want to use means that there isn't one because of what we just discussed. We could debate until each one of us died and one of us would be sitting alone in a room and still saying nine and nine and nine and nine and nine and, nine and All right, so there's that. Um, now we're talking about relative minimum and relative maximum. So those are the windows where we can kind of zoom in and look at specific neighborhoods of the function. So, uh, x values where there's minimums. Where are the minimums? Where are they located? What is the, I, I'll take it back. Uh, what are the relative minimum values? One. One, okay, so we have three of them, right? There's three relative minimum values, because if I made a little neighborhood around this one, a little neighborhood around this one, this one's a little tricky because of the whole maybe you got tripped up, but that is a value of the function. So the x value that corresponds to these, what's the x value here? Negative 3 and 2. Okay, negative 3, 1, and 2. How about relative maximum? No, I think there's only one. What about this one? Is this one? Correct. Okay, 
and so it only occurs at negative one. So I highlighted this one because we gotta be careful it's the same way we have to be careful with this one. You may want to say that in this neighborhood, there is a maximum value of two, but because of that hole, it does not exist. So we only have the one, okay? Uh, did we do good? Did we, did we were fine on that? Obviously number four, maybe there was some, we had some debate on, but that was purposeful, okay? All right, moving on to mean value theorem. Oh no, we have an example first. No example, another. So we did one from a graph. Now here's one from an equation. Yeah, good one. Find the extrema. Uh, so this is number nine, this is in your book. So probably the next page, maybe two pages over. Okay. Um, we're given a, a domain. We're given a window that we're supposed to be looking at. So go ahead and try that. Just remember that when we're looking for the extrema, they are the y values of the original function. Okay, you're gonna end up finding the derivatives for the critical values. Just don't also, be sure to remember to test the endpoints too. So you, you could approach this problem a couple different ways. You could right away find the values at negative one and three, since you know you have to test the endpoints. If you choose to do that, that's fine. Um, and maybe if you did it that way, you wouldn't forget to check them. That being said, I didn't do that. I went and found the, I'm trying to find the critical values, critical numbers first. So in order to do that, I need to take the first derivative. And so the first derivative of f of x is two to the negative one third minus two. All right, and then to find where the critical values might be, I just have to figure out when that equals zero or is undefined, okay? And so it, it's probably better to look at that in a way that is easier for us to understand. And instead of making it x to the negative one third, we just make it the cube root of x on the bottom, okay? So of course, there's two possibilities here. Uh, in order for all of this to equal, I need it to equal two to make it zero, right? So I can move the two over. And in, in order for this to happen, what does this denominator have to equal? In order for this to be true, one, yeah, x has to equal one, okay? So the cube root of x has to equal one, which means x has to equal one. So that should be one critical value. Um, and then of course we have what value would make this undefined? Zero, okay, so I have my two uh, critical values because zero would make it undefined, my critical numbers. Right? Um, so I have to see what the value of the function is at zero, at one, at negative one, at three, and then I'll be able to find the extrema, okay? And so that's sort of the next step in the process. And I just went ahead and listed them. All right, we're gonna have to find all four of those. Did you find four? Did you find four values? Yes? No? If you didn't find four, what did you do? Forgot about zero. Okay, right. The undefined. Good. All right. Um, so we're just, we'll just knock them out one at a time. Okay, so I plug uh, negative one in. So, and again, make sure you're plugging into the original. So negative one, this two on top means you're squaring it. So that turns that positive. So this is really the cube root of one, which is one. So this is three plus two, which is five. The zero one's really easy. Bada bing, bada boom, done zero. Okay. Uh, one is gonna be the same as negative one, except it's gonna change here. This part will be the same. One to the two thirds is still one. But now instead of being plus two, it becomes minus two because this is positive. So this ends up being three minus two which is one. And then when I plug three in, so yeah, I, I don't know what this is either. This is three times the cube root of nine, right? Three squared is nine, cube root of, of nine. I don't know what that is. Um, so at that point, Feel free to grab a calculator, punch it all in. For that matter, you could punch it all those in. It's fine. Uh, it's approximately equal to 
uh, 0 0.240. Remember, whenever we round with decimals or truncate, um, three places, always three places. So we have all our information. We can make a determination. Uh, what are our extrema? Um, I guess one of the questions would be, maybe I didn't say, I'd be interested to see what I said. Oh, I didn't. Good, I'm, I'm gonna fix that. So our maximum value, of course, is five. And our minimum value, of course, is zero. The question is, are they relative or absolute? I didn't answer that in the in in this, but we need to answer that. Is is this maximum an absolute or a relative, and how can you tell? Okay, it is a it is five occurs when x equals one, which makes negative one five what? Yeah, but why? What is it? In, if you were thinking about, think about a graph. It's what? It's an endpoint. Okay, that's important. This is an endpoint because yes, it occurs at one of the ends of the window. That makes us an endpoint, so it can't be relative, right? So this is uh, absolute max. All right. Uh, how about the minimum? Absolute or relative? Could it be absolute though? There's, is there another value? Okay, so when we're doing this, okay, since we don't have the graph, okay, they're always going to be absolute. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, why did you go through all of that just to confuse us to say they're always gonna be absolute? Well, we tested all the other possible points, okay? Because if I looked at a window, if I looked at a, at a skinny window here, like right around in the neighborhood of where x equals three, this could be a minimum or could be maximum. It depends what the rest of the graph looks like, okay? So when we're doing it without the graph, these are gonna be absolutes, okay? If you have the graph, you're looking at that very specific neighborhood around that x value. So, so that's what's going on there. All right, now let's get into mean value theorem. All right, so this I took from the AB book because I liked it better than what our book had. Uh, this is on page 288 in your AB book if you would prefer to go to that and screenshot from there. Uh, obviously, this should be familiar to you from last year, but it probably feels like a, oh, a year ago. It wasn't a year ago. It was less than a year ago, but still, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a minute. Okay, so I'll let you get that in your notes, and then we'll go through and talk about it a little bit. We have these conditions that must be met first, all right? F is continuous on a closed interval. So whatever window we're looking at, it's continuous on that, all right? It is differentiable on the open interval, same values. Then there's a number C inside, in between A and B somewhere, such that a couple things happen. One, the derivative at C equals this. Well, what, what is this formula? This is slope. What do we call that in calculus? Yeah, before you talked about derivative, we called it the... What about it? What kind of rate of change? Average. Average rate of change. This is the average rate... Sorry. This is the instantaneous rate of change. That's what the derivative is. Yes, no, the derivative is the inst instantaneous rate of change, but the formula for slope is the average rate. So this is why the mean value theorem is really important. There's a place in this graph, in this function, where the instantaneous rate of change and the average rate of change equal each other. Okay, And then down below is just another form of it, right? They just multiplied both sides by b minus a. Um, this one is helpful just sometimes just, you can simplify quicker. But that's, that's the sort of power here. Okay, when, when we think about the derivative, the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change at that moment. The average rate of change over a span, okay, is usually less reliable. However, there's going to be one place, at least one place, I should say, 
at least one place where those two things meet and are equal to each other. And that's what the mean value theorem is saying. If these conditions are true, these conditions are true, then this will happen in at least one spot inside of this interval. Okay. Now, um, what's important and here is that said that. Okay, the mean value theorem states that given the right conditions of continuity and differentiability, so one and two, there's at least one tangent line, okay, because that's where the instantaneous rate of change is. That's the tangent line. That will be parallel to because that instantaneous rate of change and the average rate of change, our slopes are equal. So since, since we know that the slopes of parallel lines are equal, what this is trying to say is, in terms of graphically, visually, understanding that the secant line and the tangent line will be parallel in at least one place in that interval. And in some cases, you're going to have to find out where that place is. Some places, you're just going to have to kind of eyeball it. But what I'm, what I'm going to attempt to do is illustrate it visually so that you can see how this all kind of works. I'm going to put a little picture up that I want you to take a picture of. And this is where I, I'm proud of my work. Okay, So here's the picture I want you to take a picture of. Very basic graph, right? Uh, from some, some, some curve from A to B, it happens to look like this. This point here is A comma F of A. We're calling the function F. And this point here is B comma F of B. Now, what the mean value theorem states is that there is going to be a, a parallel tangent line to the secant line somewhere on this interval. It is continuous. It is differentiable. It doesn't have any... Um, holes, it doesn't have any uh, sharp turns or anything like that. Okay, so we know that it is both differentiable and continuous. So the secant line is going to just connect these two points. So at this point, what I want you to do, since you have this, you're going to draw the rest of it. I mean, I have it up there and it's all pretty, but you, you can draw it on your graph. So there's the secant line, right? So what the mean value theorem states is that somewhere along the way, there's a tangent line that will be parallel to this line at a point C, at least one point. So what I want you to do next, after you draw, draw your secant line, is try to draw a parallel tangent line on it. Try to draw a parallel tangent line on your graph. So uh, here's what your tangent line should look like, something like this, okay, parallel outside right it's outside of the graph and so what that what that's saying is there's a point where that tangent line touches the graph where there's some value c that is x where those two are the same which of course they are okay so right there is c in this case there's only one tangent line that is parallel to the secant line which means at this point the instantaneous rate of change, or the derivative at C, equals the average rate of change over this curve. And that is the slope of this line, right? So that's what the concept is that we're dealing with here. That the, we're trying to figure out what value for x will make the instantaneous rate of change and the average rate of change equal. Okay, concept? So here's the example. This is example 20, so this is probably a couple more pages by. We are going to find the value of C that is going to allow the instantaneous rate of change and the average rate of change to be equal. Assuming over that interval, it is continuous and differentiable. And if it is, then we can do this, okay? Would you like to try or would you like to do it together? try. So just keep in mind what you're trying to do. You're going you're gonna to take the average rate of change. So you're going to take the slope over the interval from 3 to 6. Slope like algebra 2 style. Then you're going to find the instantaneous rate of change, which means you're going to find the first derivative. And then we're going to see when those things collide and what value C will those two things be equal to each other. What did you get for C? Hello. 18 plus or minus what? That's so you got 
So basically, you have the square root of 18. Plus or minus square root of 18. Plus or minus the square root of 18. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. All right, so first of all, average rate of change. So we're going to find the, the y value at 6, the y value at 3. You're going to subtract them. There's your rise over 6 minus 3. There's your run. Okay, so f of 3 is 1. f of 6 is 2. So my slope, 2 minus 1 over 6 minus 3 is 1 third. Yeah? Good. All right, now we got to do the instantaneous rate of change. That requires us to find the derivative. Okay, so the derivative of f of x is, and now I, I've changed it to c because we're going to be using c. I'm going to try to find what that c value is. Um, so I, uh, obviously the derivative of 3 is 0. The derivative of negative 6x to the negative 1 is 6c now to the negative 2. You could have still left it as x, it's fine. Um, and what we're going to try to do is make these two things equal to each other, and then we can find that value for C. That's why I changed it there, because we're looking for that value of C anyway. So the next move is just to set those equal, and yes, I had to do a little thing, because I was running out of room. Um, and I changed the color. So this is C, uh, 6 over C squared equals 1 third. I'm going to use a proportion across multiple, so C squared equals 18. So yes, to find C, you have to take the square root of both sides. And whenever you take the square root of both sides, it is plus or minus. And that's why you got plus or minus square root 18. Or plus or minus 3 square roots 2, whatever. Are both of those answers valid? No, because it doesn't no. equal 0 to use the negative root. If you have Well, that has nothing to do with it, though. No. What's the issue? The interval. No. The interval is the issue. It has to be between 3 and 6. Obviously, negative square root of 18 is not in there. Okay? Uh, and we know that 3 squared is 9 and 6 squared is 36. And 18 is in between uh, 9 and 36. So we're in good shape there. So my final answer is just C, C can only be the positive. I should have circled it or something. Cool? And you can make it three square roots of two. You can make it a decimal. None of that matters, right? They're all the same. Question? Okay. So, yes, in, in, a, in a free response question, you're right. I didn't include that, and I should have done that. Thank you. All right. So, uh, continuous, because the only point of discontinu discontinuity is when x equals zero. So, it is continuous. Good point. Yeah, can't spell. Over the interval... 3, 6, and it is differentiable over the open interval, right? 3, 6. Good point. Good reminder. Thank you. I will fix my presentation for next year.